The keynote today delivered by Henrik Nieberg is Alignment at Scale. Please help me welcome Henrik Nieberg with Alignment at Scale. So um, I'm going to talk about not this, because this is a single team, and that's not too hard. Um, you just uh, kind of grab a scrum book of any sort, XP or Kanban, and you kind of do what it says, and you're pretty OK. Not like silver bullet OK, but you'll at least not be in total trouble. We've kind of figured this out, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, this gets a little trickier, a little more interesting, right? Now you have to have things like scrum of scrums, maybe, a um, little bit of synchronization. You want these arrows to move in kind of the same direction. Right? I'm not going to talk about that either. <laughs> uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. Because <sighs> that doesn't scale. <laughs> right? uh, this is a problem. Uh, what happens when you have a whole bunch of teams and they're trying to work together on something big? Well, first of all, don't do that. I mean, tr try to not build big, huge things. Try to divide it into smaller pieces and build it in small increments. It'll be easier. But sometimes, nevertheless, we have to do something big and we have a whole bunch of teams to deal with. Right? And um, what happens is sub-optimization. As in, teams really trying to do their best, given the information they have. They're optimizing. They're doing retrospectives. They're doing all this stuff, right? But we're still running into trouble because they're going in different directions. So how do we solve that? I don't have any silver bullet solutions, but I have some observations. So this talk is all based on kind of practice, just what I've seen. Both those companies mentioned, Lego and Spotify, have been experimenting a lot with how do we, how do we uh, um, synchronize and align a whole bunch of teams. Um, OK, silly metaphor. I'm going to, so those of you who know me know that I like silly metaphors. So here's the first one, OK? <laughs> Some optimization. What the heck is that? Well, uh, here's a bunch of people building a bridge, right? And they're building a bridge because they want to cross the river. And they're happily plodding along with that. Meanwhile, without them knowing it, this is going on. <laughs> They're also trying to solve the problem, right? It's another team. And then finally they notice each other and they're like, what the fuck? You, you guys are building a tunnel? Or what, what, you guys are, you know. <laughs> How many of you have seen that kind of thing going on? Right? Hand up if you've seen this kind of thing going on, right? Great. Yeah. Uh, yaw. I have to practice my yaw, my South African yaw. Yaw. Help me with that. How do I say it? Yaw. That's actually Swedish. Yeah, it's the same as Swedish. Yaw. Except that in Swedish, it technically means yes. I don't know if it's the same. Same? Right. What, what about no? It's no? OK, in Swedish, it's nay. Right. Yeah. Anyway, um, so a common reaction to this is, well, I told you guys this agile, hippie, autonomy bullshit wouldn't work. We better get someone in here to take charge of things, right? Yeah, have you seen that happen? Yeah. So obviously, Agile doesn't work because of that. So we've got to do something different. We've got to take charge. That's based on a misconception that you're either aligned or autonomous. Right? So either uh, do what I say or do whatever the hell you want. And then you know, with, with, with this result. Right? So um, I find this to be a, a false dichotomy, as in it's not either or. It's more useful to think of it as an uh, orthogonal relationship. And what does that mean? Well, OK, this is today's two by two. There's only going to be one, I promise. Right? So you have to bear with me. But it, it is a two by two, I'm warning you. Right? Consultants like two by twos. Um, <laughs> alignment enables autonomy. What does that mean? Well, on the bottom left uh, quadrant, um, we have organizations where there's low alignment, low autonomy. That basically means you go to work and you just do what the manager tells you. You don't ask questions. Right? So uh, what I mean by alignment is seeing the big picture and run, moving together in that direction. So these people aren't quite aligned. They don't know why they're going to work, um, other than to get salary and then be able to go home. <laughs> and they're not very autonomous because they're being told what to do. Not very fun. This organization up in the top left, uh, they actually, they're more aligned because they have people, people like managers clarifying the why. Why are we here, right? We, we need to cross this river. But then they're also being told how to solve it. So therefore, build a bridge, right? So now we have high alignment, but, all, but not too much autonomy. We're still being told what to do. It's better, but I mean, it, the, the, the productivity of the team will be limited by the talent and skills of the manager, right? Which can be a pretty big limit sometimes. So um, what, is, what about if we have high align, alignment and high autonomy? Well, that basically means that the leaders are saying, this is the problem we need to solve, uh, but, and this is why we need to solve it. You figure out how. And that's a whole lot better, because now we're unleashing the, the, the skills and creativity of, of, the, of the teams. 
get better solutions. Plus, it's more fun. <laughs> um, this is what I mean by aligned autonomy. As in, the more alignment we can provide to the teams, the more autonomy we can give them because they're going to use that autonomy in a good way if they understand the why. Does that make sense? Right. So aligned autonomy. Um, and the bottom right quadrant, that, that's, that's the kind of bridge tunnel situation, right? Where uh, the teams are very autonomous, but nobody knows what they're doing, right? Um, so the manager's like, well, I hope someone's working on the river problem. I, I have no idea. <laughs> um, so how do we actually achieve this? Next metaphor, soup. <laughs> I'm going to present this as a series of ingredients that you want to put into soup, the alignment soup. And these ingredients together will increase the odds of achieving aligned autonomy, right? I just picked a few ingredients, the one that, to me, seems to be the most kind of critical ones. You know, your opinions may, may, may of course, vary. But um, one, one ingredient you definitely need in, the, in this, in this uh, dish is um, shared purpose as I've already been hinting at, right, the shared purpose. Because we get all these people, and they really need to understand why, why are we here, what problem are we trying to solve. And one way to test that is just to ask people, right? So, you know, wh what are you working on today? And, and why? You can ask yourself that too. What am I working on today, and, and, and why? And if you get answers like, well, well I'm working on X because uh, Sam said it's important, right? Uh, okay, and, and we're done when Sam is okay with it, right? It's not quite the alignment I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and what about this one? We're working on X because we feel like it. And we're done when, guess what? We don't feel like it anymore, right? <laughs> uh, not quite what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. Um, we're working on X because, because we think it's going to give impact Y. Right? We think it's going to make this number of users join our system. We think it's going to solve that problem for this user segment. And that matters to the company because of, of Z. When the, when the teams kind of have this top of mind. And we're, and we're done when the metrics have moved. So we're not done when we've shipped. We're done when we can see that, that the metrics have, have actually, we've achieved our, our purpose. Wow, isn't that awesome if you, if you can do that? Not a lot of teams are here, but the closer you can get, the better. Because this is what aligned autonomy looks like and, and, and sounds like. Um, and this ha happens at different levels. So it, it can happen at an individual level, like you and me are working on the same feature, right? Um, so we need to align. We need to understand the purpose of this feature. Or it could be these two teams are working on, on the same product. So they need to align on how your stuff fits with my stuff. Right? Maybe I shouldn't be doing my stuff. Maybe I should help you with your stuff because that's more important to the, to, to the product as a whole. Right? And, and, even, and even at a company level because here's a bunch of teams working on another product, but we're in the same company. Right? And the company has a purpose as well. So if everybody understands how this product is helping to fulfill the company's mission, it's easier for us to interact and align with, with other, other teams. So purpose happens at different levels. And, and you can think of it kind of like a, like, like a chain of purposes. So here are the, these two teams again. You know, we're gathering wood, right? And, and we're uh, uh, creating a foundation. Why? Well, because we're building a bridge. It's supposed to fit together. And why are we building a bridge? Well, because we want people to be able to cross the river so that uh, we can connect the two villages, so that we make life easier for everybody, and yeah, et cetera. Um, so shared purpose is one really critical ingredient. It kind of starts there. Without that ingredient, everything else kind of falls apart. Um, it's also, in a sense, the easiest ingredient because this is just about over-communicating. Just keep over-communicating the purpose of, of this project, of this product, of this whatever. So ingredient number two. Are you ready? Continue making this soup, right? Transparency. And some of you may now be thinking, like, but duh, this is just like any agile method just putting up the same old words that we keep talking about. And, and, and that's for a reason, because it's really important. And it's also, it's extra important when you've got a bunch of teams. So I'll talk a little bit about, about how. Um, so I'm going to be giving some examples from Spotify. Spotify, Swedish music streaming service, right? I think it's not officially available here yet, but it better damn be soon, right? Or is it? No, damn it. Go home and push them a little bit. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about Lego. It's, it's a toy maker. They make plastic bricks you can put together. It's really cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> at, at Spotify, uh, we talk a lot about, North, about company beliefs, which is like, why are we here? And basically, to turn the music industry upside down and make it make, make, make Spotify's belief is that music makes people happy, makes the world a better place. And if we can make sure everybody around the world can access music really easily, wherever they are, whatever device they have, we'll have a better world. 
and if we also can make sure that artists can get compensated for that, then great, right? So that's kind of a, a high level summary of the purpose of Spotify as a company, but they talk a lot about that. If you ask anybody at Spotify, what is this company about, they'll pretty much tell you this, which is powerful. And then they also define North Star goals, like we call it North Star goals, things like, well, along the way of making the world a better place, we have a milestone reaching X million active users, or becoming a world-class employer based on this or that metric, right? So this is just like, most companies have this kind of stuff, right? Why are we here? What are the high-level goals? But what we've also started adding lately, in the past year, is something called um, company bets, which is a way of phrasing a high-level initiative that affects many people at the company. So think of it kind of like a company backlog item, right? So launch in country A. How about South Africa? <laughs> um, or, or build a new product capability B. We call these bets, and I'll explain why in a moment. Now the idea of a bet is a bet is like an alignment point because bets typically involve development teams, HR, sales, or just different parts of the company. And um, all the teams that are working for the same bet, that, that becomes an, an, an alignment point, right? So Sony PlayStation integration. Okay, you're working on that, I'm working on that, let's synchronize with each other. Um, but we also use bets to kind of visualize what the whole company is doing. So we have this single, it's actually a Google spreadsheet. Not very sexy, but very convenient, right? So uh, kind of like a company Kanban board inside a spreadsheet. This is the whole thing. It's not bigger than that. It fits on a screen. Um, it's kind of backwards compared to most common boards. The, the, the way left is now, and then, it, then next, and then later. So it flows from right to left. Because we figure when you look at a document, you normally start reading from the left. We want you to see the now immediately. So, and, and that's where all the bets are. So everybody can see what, what are the main things going on in the company. Of course, there's thousands of stuff going on under the radar, things that are too small to be, vi to be visible on the company bets board. That's fine. But this shows the kind of big cross-cutting things, right? Um, now each bet also has a two-page brief. So when you click on that, when you click on one of these lines, you get to a, a two-page document. The first page is pretty standard kind of purpose-related information, such as what are the success metrics for this bet? How would we know if it's succeeding? Who are some of the kind of people driving this, et cetera? The second page is what's kind of interesting, though, kind of different from what I've seen in other companies. It is the dib. Right, how many of you have seen a dib before? A dib, yeah. It's, it's actually, it's actually a, a, a four letter, it's another four letter acronym. So I apologize for adding yet another acronym to this world. Um, my excuse is that I didn't make it up myself. And uh, what this is, it, uh, the dib stands for data insight belief bet. And what it shows is the, 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 chain, the train of thinking, or the chain of thought that led us to decide to work on this bet. For example, and this is something that actually happened in the past and probably happened to many other companies. Um, data, uh, well, data is, is what is the hard data that we have as a basis for, for working on this thing, right? Um, in this case, what happened was a few years ago, we noticed that, oh shit, look, uh, desktop users going down, mobile usage going up, right, for our product. And at the same time, look at how we're staffed, mobile devs, desktop devs. Hmm, this is just data, right? The second column is insights. So what insights does this data give us about the world? In this case, well, the insight is mobile is overtake, overtaking desktop as primary music gadget. That's what the data is telling us. Well, that's my insight from it. And we have very few mobile devs compared to desktop. That's an insight. The next column, belief, means uh, what, is that, what is our belief about Spotify's place in the world based on this insight, right? Well, this insight tells us that, shit, we're in trouble, right? <laughs> We're optimized for the wrong thing. Uh, desktop, desktop is going out. So for long-term survival, we need to become mobile first. That's a belief, right? Note that none of this is facts. It's just beliefs. And because of that, we're, now ma we're making bets. And, the, and this is, by the way, several years ago. But uh, so our bets were like hire a bunch of mobile devs, train a bunch of desktop devs into mobile devs, and build infrastructure for iterating fast on mobile, right? And as we execute on these bets, we learn things, and the feedback loop gives us new data, new insights, new beliefs, et cetera. So it's just a way of looking at the world. But what's nice about this kind of argument framework is that it shows the thinking behind. So everybody sees, well, this is why we're launching in country A, right? And they can argue about it. They can say, actually, I don't agree with this belief, or I have some other data, right? So it's, it's, it's just a communication tool, but a very helpful one. So what it does, it helps us notice earlier when this is going on, right? We might notice it already inside a, a, in a planning phase or in a prototyping uh, session, right? So this kind of stuff still happens, but it ha we tend to notice it earlier. Okay, next example, Lego. 
I'm going to jump back and forth, just to kind of uh, pepper this little talk with, with concrete examples. What the heck is that? <laughs> this is um, a dependency board for 20 teams at Digital Solutions at LEGO. They build all the digital stuff at LEGO. And what, what the heck is a dependency board? Some of you may have seen it. Um, it shows, uh, the, the top row is, is teams. So here's 20 teams. And uh, can you see my point? I'm, I'm gonna, this is unfair. I'm going to go over here for a while. All right. Hi. <laughs> Uh, top row is, is, is uh, uh, teams, and over here is uh, sprints. So we're looking a few sprints ahead. And each yellow node is something that this team is going to deliver during that sprint. And the red yarn leads to a pink note, which is a dependency. So if in order for us to do this, we need that from you by this time. So it shows who needs what from whom and when. And this is a centralized tool, yes, but it's there to enable a decentralized behavior. Um, and what's interesting when you look at it, you start seeing patterns like, what the heck? Look at this uh, group here, CIT. They're like completely a bottleneck. Everybody's dependent on them. We've got to do something about it. So it allows us to optimize the bottleneck, but also look for systemic reasons for why we have the bottleneck in the first place. Right. So this is a, um, an example of, of, of how transparency helps teams align. Nobody owns this. Nobody's managing this. This is just like a marketplace to help people discover where there needs to be handshaking going on. Like, okay, you, you and me, we need to synchronize because look. And uh, on, this is inside the office in, in Bilund uh, twice per week, I think, nowadays. All the Scrum Masters get to meet in front of this board to synchronize, follow up on, on how, how we're doing with these dependencies. And, uh, every, and this just covers four sprints. So after that, we just throw the board away and make a new one. OK. Um, this is just some examples of transparency. But it becomes extra important with a bunch of teams because you really need to have some way for the teams to see what the heck is going on, right? Not only here, but over there. OK, more ingredients. Ready? I'm going to give you five. And then we're probably out of time by then. Uh, feedback loops. Um, I like to think of Agile like a homing missile. I'm not much for war metaphors, but this one actually fits quite well. <laughs> um, so there's the goal, or there I think the goal is. And there's no point planning too much, because it's going to move. <laughs> but so just get this thing flying in roughly the right direction. And then because of the feedback loop, every sprint or so, we look at, well, where are we now in relation to where the goal appears to be? And has anything changed? And oops, uh, oh, there's wind here, right? I uh, didn't think about that when we aimed first. So we need to turn. So surprises happen, and then you adapt. Right? Inspect and adapt. Good old scrum mantra. And then, of course, oops, the goal moved, or the goal wasn't where I thought it was. Uh, turn again. Right? This is good old vanilla agile. And this is what you need to scale, the feedback loop. So uh, in a single team, again, just basically take any Scrum XP Kanban book and do what it says, and you get a pretty good set of feedback loops that'll help you a whole lot, right? Um, at different levels, process level, product level, et cetera, you get good feedback loops. But with multiple teams, you need to kind of add some more, right? So you need across the teams. How do we, you know, what are you working on? What am I working on? How does this relate to each other? Cross team sync. Someone might call it Scrum of Scrums. You need to do that for retrospective. Same thing there. Right? We don't want to just improve locally. We want to improve the whole system. So we've got to do retrospectives together sometimes. But maybe most importantly, the product itself. We need a regular review cadence for the product, where everything comes together to look at it. Really, really important. In fact, um, at, at Spotify, we used to be really bad at doing big projects. We're really good at iterating on small things. But when we, whenever we did big projects, we always had a lot of pain. We've gotten a lot better at it now. And I spent a lot of time facilitating retrospectives for our big projects. And the pattern is very clear that this, having this whole product review on a weekly basis for us is a critical success factor. So I'll talk more about that. Um, here's a team doing one week sprints. There's a team doing two week sprints, for example. So we can say, well, every second week, everything comes together and we looked at the whole product. Right? Even if some teams aren't doing sprints at all, maybe they're doing Kanban, it doesn't matter. We can still say that every second week, it all has to come together. So at, at Spotify, we have this Friday demo concept. And it's really powerful. I'll, I'll give an example. We had, we had a pretty big project a few years ago with maybe 10, 15, 20 teams. And we, we were getting near the end. And there was a hard deadline. We had a really hard deadline because on that date, the CEO was going to get up on stage in front of the world's media and show off about this new thing. So we didn't want to have him make a fool of himself in front of everybody. So we wanted to give him good stuff. And uh, as we were just a few weeks away from the final date, we kind of had checked off the boxes. Like, from a velocity perspective, 
from a release burnout perspective, we were on track. It was fine. But when we did the demo, and we're all sitting up there, it was, it was actually, we're a lot more people than here. In the cafeteria, looking at the whole product, there was this awkward silence afterwards. And then finally, someone had the courage to speak up and say, listen, this isn't very good, is it? <laughs> and people were like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not very good. <laughs> Where's the wow? There's no wow, right? It's just like, eh, we did all this stuff, but right, who cares? Right? Where's the wow? There's no wow. So we needed to find the wow, and, and, this, and this triggered kind of a, a, a bit of a mini crisis and a, a replanning session, just kind of ad hoc in the cafeteria. And we, and we pretty much concluded that we, we should rip out this whole part of the product, which a whole bunch of teams have been working on. And they, they agreed. We take that out for now. It's not good enough. And we put all the focus on these parts, which is the good stuff, but it needs to, needs, it needs to improve. It's a pretty radical change in the roadmap. It would not have happened if we didn't have that everybody looking at the actual product from the eyes of, of, of end users. Really important. So um, back to Lego. There we have this um, every second month, everybody gets together within this department, the digital solutions. And why did they do that? Well, because, didn't I have that picture? Excuse me, let's go check if I'm missing a picture here. Yeah, I'm missing a picture, but never mind. I can explain that what I was going to show. So um, b before we had this, this event where everybody got together, we used to have this problem because at Lego they have this really mature and kind of well-oiled portfolio and budgeting mechanism for the whole company. It's one of their success factors. So they had that kind of up here. And then down here we had all these teams doing Scrum, right? But in the middle, it was just like a twilight zone. A whole bunch of project managers, product owners, product directors running around with spreadsheets and meetings trying to synchronize between the portfolio level stuff and what's going on in the scrum teams just to keep everybody aligned and synchronized. So a lot of people working full time running around trying to keep all the teams synchronized. Nobody liked this. So we had to try something different. And we, what we ended up with was this which worked a whole lot better which is basically every second month everybody gets together like this. 20 people, 150 people, 100, 150 people, 20 teams uh, a whole day and basically spend that whole day getting aligned. And what, what the heck does that mean? Well, um, first we do a demo. So a mini video just showing, you know, the past two months, what have we done, right? Just a highlight. And um, that gives everybody a bit of context, like, oh, look, we've made some progress since the last two months. And uh, then we, most of the day is, is breakouts. A bunch of teams doing the equivalent of a sprint planning meeting, but kind of on a larger scale. So looking ahead of a, a few sprints at a high level and running around synchronizing with each other just to get a rough sense of who's working on what. In many cases, they're working on different products, but they still need to synchronize because they have dependencies. Right? So kind of like an open space uh, flavored um, common planning session. And as they do that, uh, the teams are also creating boards. So each team has uh, a planning board, which is, is growing as the day passes. And, um, yeah, the friends team, how did you guess? <laughs> and uh, the planning board contains things like, what, what, you know, what impact are we trying to make over the next two months? Well, we want to enable corporate HR to promote jobs at Lego, blah, blah, blah. We want to enable Lego House to administer tours, um, things, right? What, do we wanna, what problem do we want to solve for whom, roughly? And here's some stretch objectives, things we hope to solve, but we're not entirely confident we could do that within this time frame. And um, some risks, what are the things that might cause trouble for us, right? And if, the, if we can't solve the risks, then we escalate it to management immediately the same day. And to the right is kind of like a rough take at a sprint plan for the next few sprints. Just a, a tentative high level. This is mostly to identify dependencies and constraints. Um, on top of that, we'll also be doing sprint planning meetings during the sprints. So this doesn't replace that, it just gives a high level synchronization point. And then, uh, at the end of the day, all the teams will do a kind of sharing thing where they, they, they move and, and like do mini presentations for each other and walk around looking at each other's plans. This is just feedback, right? We're, we're learning from each other and we're noticing problems. Like, wait, uh, it looks like you're building a bridge. <laughs> Come over here. <laughs> we're building a tunnel. Maybe we should, you know, talk to each other. So um, the pattern here is plan on a cadence, release on demand. So every second month, we have this synchronization planning event. But Releasing is decoupled from that. Some teams release very often, some teams release more seldom, but the two-month thing is not a batch release, it's just a synchronization point. Very, very powerful and cheap way to keep teams synchronized. 
And then all these people, project managers, product owners that used to run around with spreadsheets and meetings, and came, suddenly they don't have to do that anymore. They can do more useful stuff, right? So that's great. Nobody misses that. Feedback loops, yes. Um, just some examples. Is this useful to you? I hope so. Otherwise, I have other talks you know, I can just pull up, right? <laughs> so, right. Um, feedback loops, OK. Uh, next ingredient, clear priorities. There's always so much to do, right? So much we want to do. In the case of Spotify, we want to launch in South Africa, of course, right? Build new product capability. Um, innovate on something, build infrastructure for something else. A lot of stuff, right? Can't do it all at once. We need to prioritize. That's why we have backlogs, right? That's why we have product owners. But what about at a, at a higher level, right? Across multiple projects, or at a portfolio level, or at a company level? Well, it's easy. All you do is prioritize, right? Like that, right? Great. What do you think? <laughs> so it's not much to say about prioritization. Just do it and it's done. <laughs> no, this doesn't work, right? What's the problem here? Everything's high priority, right? It's silly. You can't do that. Um, I, I've just given up on high, medium, low. It, it just doesn't make sense. Any, time, any company I see that has the concept of high, medium, low, just try to bust that myth. Visualize how many things you have at high level, how many things you have at low prior. You'll quickly see that this doesn't make sense and we need to stop doing it. Okay, what do you do instead? Well, guess. Just like you do with a team, right? A product backlog, you order it. So this is what we do now. Um, it's a surprisingly hard sell. But once you do it, it's kind of like, duh, why, why didn't we always do this? This makes sense. So what's interesting about this? Well, there's only one thing that gets to be number one, right? And if something else becomes number one, then darn, the other thing becomes number two. <laughs> so um, how do we know what to make number one? That's why we need these company beliefs and these North Star goals. Because that's what enables people to have these conversations. You look at the DIB, data, insight, bet, belief. You look at the North Star goals, the company beliefs. That becomes the basis for deciding this goes first, this is number two. And it's not permanent, right? We have these regular meetings every six weeks and every quarter where we go through these things and kind of update the priorities. So it kind of corresponds to the company level sprint planning meeting, roughly, except that it's more Kanban-like than sprint because we're not batching these into a time box, right? Anyway, um, so only one thing gets to be a priority one, and the kind of uh, discussion tool we use is if we only can do one of these two things, which one would we do? Of course we're not going to do just one of these two. It's a 2,000 person company. Most of these are going to happen in parallel. A lot of them are fairly independent, right? But nevertheless, theoretically, if we only could do one, which one would we, would we do? That's the guiding question. All right, and of course, why? <laughs> so uh, this is on the, on, the, on the bets board, right? You see there, rank, one, two, three, four, five. We're really strict about that. Everything has rank, even over here in next and later, right? So now means stuff that we're putting significant effort into right now. There's a bunch of teams working on this. Next means we're more like in some kind of a think it phase. We're doing prototyping. We're exploring this space, right? Um, so we're putting some effort into it, but not a whole lot. And we're not sure this is going to become anything, right? And later is stuff we're actually not working on, but it's highly likely that that's going to be the next thing. We used to have a lot more complicated columns, but we ended up with this simple now, next, later. And it's spreading all over the company. It's quite interesting. A lot of teams are starting to use now, next, later as their basis, basic way of looking at the world. Although one team added a column they called Nexter. Now, nexter, and the next, and the next. <laughs> People get creative. Um, so uh, the, the, this company bets board is like a high-level prioritization, visualization, and that informs lower-level priorities. So because we now know that launching in country A is the top thing, what about us? We're the infrastructure tribe, right? The infrastructure department. Uh, maybe we don't have explicitly our stuff on the company bets board, but now that we know that Spotify wants to launch in country A, what do we need to do? What should be our top number one thing? Right? Maybe we should go to the cloud or something, right? So um, the company best board doesn't cover all the work that's going on. It just shows the bigger things. But it acts as a tool to help other parts of the organization prioritize their work and visualize their priorities. And by visualizing it, people can argue about it and say, no, I don't think you should do this. I think you should do that. Do that because of this. And the conversations just get more uh, productive and you get less 
decibel-driven prioritization, if you know what I mean, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so here's a pretty typical example. Like here's a bunch of teams working on the Sony PlayStation integration, and down here we have a couple of teams working on, on, the, on the running experience, right? Where Spotify is as a, used as a tool to make your jog more pleasant. Um, well, so what about these guys over here, tools and infrastructure? Um, how do they decide what to work on today? Well, because they know that the Sony PlayStation integration is the number one bet, and by the way, I'm just making this up, these are just examples, <laughs> then uh, they know that they should look at their needs first. Right? We'll focus on infrastructure that they need. Of course, because it's infrastructure, it's gonna be useful to maybe all teams, but we still focus on their needs first. And then, uh, depending on our bandwidth, we'll, we'll focus, on, focus on, their, on their needs second, right? So it helps everybody make better decisions. By the way, disclaimer, things never work as nicely as they look like on slides. <laughs> that applies to all presentations, all case studies you ever see. It always looks nicer on a slide than it is in reality. Reality is messy, dirty, and problematic, of course. Um, but what, with that said, this whole kind of approach has helped us get to a better position, right? And maybe most importantly, a tool like this can be used um, as a tool of oppression if you use it wrong, right? You could say, well, what are you working on today? Ooh, that's not on this list. You know, you're not aligned, right? <laughs> you have to work on this because that's on the company bets board. I need to pretty much push people. That's not the intent here. Um, so it's, it's one of, this is one of the examples of a tool which can be used to build something nice or to hit someone on the head with, right? It's just how you use a tool. So the mindset here is um, each squad, which is what we call teams at Spotify, is responsible for deciding how to make best use of their own time. That's what autonomy kind of means. And they have lots of things pulling at their attention. So here's another squad saying, hey, we need your help, right? Here's infrastructure people saying, oh, you got to upgrade to the new build server. Um, they have their own backlog. Uh, there's Jira tickets, bug reports coming in, and they have um, their own crazy ideas, right? And there's uh, user data, metrics, A-B tests, showing us data. All this is signals, right? And the team has to make sense of all the signals to decide on what the heck are we going to work on right now. The idea is that the bet board is just another signal. It's a strong signal, but it is just yet another signal. So, and the product owner is kind of the, the custodian of this, or the voice of the business. So is really trying to help, make, making sure the team understands what's going on in the rest of the company, and if there are any connections. But with that information, at the end of the day, the team still decides what they're gonna work on. And they may decide to work on something that has nothing to do with anything on this board. That's okay, as long as that, that decision is intentional and not accidental. Does that make sense? It's, it's an important difference. So uh, yeah, this is about providing context. If teams see what's going on, if they see the high-level picture, then they can make better decisions locally. Right? Back to Lego. Is this confusing? Jumping around? So uh, this is, uh, again, that big planning meeting, right? The, the, the single day thing. What's going on here? Well, that is a program backlog. It is actually um, a unified list of what is all the infrastructure that we need right now at Lego. So a bunch of different product owners have gotten together and negotiated and made a single list, single stack rank. And this is a bunch of teams during the planning session that are trying to decide who's gonna work on what for the next few months. So they pulled, so a program, um, a, a, an item on this backlog is like a, a something a, a bit bigger than a sprint typically, right? And it's gonna get broken down into, into sprint size stuff. Um, so program backlog, right? Single stack rank, teams pull stuff from it. The pull aspect is very important, they're pulling. In the case of Lego, they are semi-specialized. This might be a search team. That might be a monitoring team. So they're semi-specialized. We're normally gonna pull search-related stuff. But because we see the big picture, sometimes we might actually pull something else to help another team. So we get this kind of balance between, semi, between specialized versus generalized teams. And uh, um, some teams don't like to do that physically with papers, instead they do it digitally. It's kind of the same. So there is a projector showing up, um, in this case using Rally. This is a view that shows the program backlog. There's a stack rank, right, from top to bottom. And then you can literally just pull from here whoop, over to there into your team, and that bar shows kind of like what's your you know, capacity based on yesterday's weather and velocity. Are we fully booked or not, right? So this is a way to ensure that we don't kind of overcommit. Um, and during that planning day, there's, there's always gonna be problems coming up, right? 
like, oh shit, we can't do this because we need that from those guys and those guys are doing this for them so they can't do that for us and shit, what do we do now, right? Um, so uh, those things get escalated to the management review. Happens after lunch. All the managers get together and kind of the key stakeholders, decision makers, they get together and they have to deal with whatever wasn't resolved at the team level, right? So that becomes their to-do for this session. Everybody else is off having lunch and they have to stay here and do this. Then they get to go have lunch, so it's good. Gives them an incentive, right? Um, and this is another example of the feedback loop, right? Problems happen. Sometimes hard decisions need, need to be made. We cannot release both product A and product B. We need to take a pick. Darn, right? So escalate to hard decisions. Make a decision immediately. Um, and if we can't make a decision immediately, at least decide who's going to decide, right? And then after lunch, sh um, feedback to the teams. So this problem got escalated, and, and, and here's what we, what we decided about. So this is a way of getting managers to become, it kind of promotes the servant leadership aspect, right? That we're all in this to kind of pitch in. So four ingredients so far, shared purpose, transparency, feedback loops, clear priorities. Um, ready for the last one? Do we have time for the last one? Ah, we're fine, okay. Organizational learning. What do we mean by that? If that was one of the themes of this conference, in fact. Not a coincidence I put it in. <laughs> the thing is, when you're working with a bunch of teams, I mean, everything can improve. So give me some examples of things that might be problematic here that you can actually improve. Communication, Communication. what else? What kind of things might come up on the retrospective? What about this side of the room? Give me an example. Alignment, can you be more concrete, specific? What? Yeah, how do we communicate? Yeah? Language issues could be a problem. It could be, it could be technical as well, like, uh, like programming languages, right? Like, uh, should we use this or that language for this part of the product? We should align on that, right? What about here, any examples? How do we handle cross-team dependencies? That could definitely be a topic. Yeah, so pretty much anything can, can improve. There's gonna be a whole lot of things that, that, are, that are problematic. Maybe how we release, how do we, how do we, in practice, how do we make sure we always have a functioning release candidate? How do we do continuous delivery with, with mobile phones, right? All kinds of things come up. And you gotta make sure that this is improving. So the standard way is retrospectives, but retrospectives can cause sub-optimization if you just do it at a team level. So you also need to do it kind of at a cross-team level. And um, often it doesn't happen, and here's why. There's Joe, right, Ch chopping down the tree, working very hard, right? He has a lot of trees to chop down. And then Lisa comes along, she's just been at a conference and learned something really cool. <laughs> right? Coming back, hey Joe, I heard about this really cool thing, right? And, and Joe's response is? Yeah. <laughs> Can't you see, I'm busy, right? I don't have time for this. In a way he's right, because I mean in the short term, if I just give him the tool, here, use it right now, what's, what's gonna happen? gonna try to chop a tree down with this chainsaw, right? It's, it's, you know, he's gonna be like, this tool sucks, right? <laughs> this is very stupid tool, right? So, you know, you gotta learn to use that tool. You might also chop off someone's arm, you gotta be careful. So there is a learning curve and therefore it's gonna cost, it's gonna make you slower in the short term, right? So improvement costs, it makes you slower in the short term. Um, this is an old metaphor, but of course it's very valid, right? Um, so you need slack. And this is a really big problem in most companies I've seen. You need slack, as in you need to be not 100% busy. Otherwise, you're here. So where does slack come from in an organization? Well, on a very kind of pragmatic level, one is pull scheduling. If teams are actually allowed to pull in work and decide how much work to do this sprint, if they're not allowed to do that, someone else pushes in work, say, well, according to the Gantt chart, you're supposed to do these 18 features, this sprint, we'll tend to push in too much work, right? If a team can pull in work, they can look at how much did we get done last sprint. Um, so using yesterday's weather, they can pull in just enough work for this sprint. And they can also leave some slack, except that they often don't, right? But should, because without that, you don't get organizational learning. So leave some spare capacity, not only for organizational learning, but also to avoid sub-optimization. Because maybe in the middle of the sprint, team A is working on something, and then suddenly team B runs into a big problem and they need a little bit of help from you, just a little bit, maybe an hour, and then we'll get them unstuck, right? That's great. 
And Scrum itself is considered a bad thing, right? That's an unplanned item. You should keep it, keep it away. In practice, when it comes to scaling, you need to be pragmatic, right? Yes, it's an unplanned item. And yes, we should do it because it's helping the whole project and not just our team. So if we have Slack in our, in our, in our plan, we could go help them, right? If we don't have Slack in our plan, we're likely going to say, don't bother us. We're busy. And now everything goes slower. So we need Slack. And in order to have Slack, we need uh, non-full plans. And in order to have non-full plans, we need pull and teams that understand the value of Slack. Then, of course, there's scheduled Slack, right? That's what's nice about Agile methods, uh, retrospectives. It's a kind of scheduled Slack. We build it in some time. And during this time, we're not delivering anything. We're not building anything. We're not doing anything for the customer. We're just making space to talk about improvement. You can put in Slack between sprints. We can say that, well, the sprint ends on Thursday afternoon, and the next sprint starts on Monday, and the Friday between is just nothing. It's empty. Right? People might be like, oh, but what are we doing on Friday? I don't know. It'll probably be very useful, but I don't, I don't know right now what we're going to do on Friday. Right? We'll, we'll see. It's a hard sell sometimes. <laughs> but most importantly, I would say this is a cultural thing, and therefore kind of hard to influence, but you can influence it by role modeling it and a culture that promotes learning, where, where, where it's OK to get together like this and, and, and do a lunch and learn and tell someone else, like, here's what we learned. And people will actually show up. Right? If, that if that works, you have a good culture for that. But because other cultures will, will emphasize busyness. right? If you're not busy delivering, then you do something wrong. In that kind of culture, it's very hard to, to put in any kind of slack. Guerrilla techniques might work. Right? <laughs> right. What about spreading them? We're learning all these things. Like this team over here just learned some really cool new framework. Or this team just nailed continuous delivery on mobile. Right? They're releasing every day. They've got a new build coming out on the, on the phone. And they have a, every, every commit is, is showing up in some kind of a, um, emulator. I don't know. But they've, they've, they've got it all figured out. This is actually a very real case, because that happened at Spotify. We worked a lot with how to, how to iterate fast on mobile. And some teams started really getting it. But how do we spread that to other teams? Um, that's hard. I found some things that work so-so, like lunch and learn, better than nothing. But this is OK to, to transfer some simple thing, like here's a pattern for how to do a good retrospective. You can transfer that knowledge. But more deeper things, like how do I write sustainable, high-quality code? You can't you know, just do a lunch and learn, and you're done, right? <laughs> so what else can you do? Well, you can do cross-team retrospectives, where a few representatives get together, or maybe everyone gets together, do a retrospective together. That's very helpful. But still, just kind of a, I would say, mediocre results. The best results I've seen when, you, when we're talking about deeper learning is embedding. So this team really got continuous delivery. How are they going to transfer it? The only time I've seen that really work is somebody here literally moves to here and joins their team for an extended period. Because that knowledge is kind of tacit. It's implicit. And now they take it with them. And they use it every day. And it starts spreading. I, I, I've seen cases where the whole team, and, I, and I'm not kidding, the whole team literally moved to here and embedded with them, like squeezed in, pairing, sitting next to them, like at their desk, and sat with them for like weeks just to transfer this knowledge. And then they went back. So embedding can be done in different ways. But what's interesting about embedding is that's also one of those kind of um, counterintuitive things. Because what does Scrum say about teams? Stable teams. You don't move people around, right? So let, let's talk a bit about that. Um, that Scrum came from an environment where people couldn't get anything done because they're getting disrupted all the time, moved around all the time. Right? So if you have people who can never actually be allowed to sit with a specific number of other people and actually get to know each other and get to work effectively, if they keep getting yanked around, we never learn anything. And we're always stressed. And we can never really, yeah, we just get very improductive. And that's kind of the basis for where Agile came from. right? Um, but what about the other end of the scale, 100% stable teams? What happens, well, OK, we get more efficient teams. Or we get people get to know each other, and they can work together and use each other's cross-functional skills. It's great. But what's the but? You can get bored from seeing the same people every day, yes. What else? Sharing knowledge across teams. Yeah, it becomes kind of like silos, right? These teams can become silos. Um, so, and because of the silos, you get slow organizational learning. This team may be really good at something that they really suck at, and the knowledge is just not moving, right? So 100% stable teams are, are, are overrated. I recommend mostly stable teams. 
suitably vague. <laughs> and what does that mean? Well, it means a stable core. Each team has a stable core. Us four, have we been here a long time, we're going to be here a long time. And then, not, not in any official way, it doesn't say core on my you know, <laughs> name card, just that we tend to stick around, and then there's some people that tend to move a little bit more often, right? So uh, in, in any given year, it's going to be these four people have been here the whole time, but every month or two or three, somebody came or, or left, right, in that team. It works best when it's within a certain set of teams. Let's say you over here, this side of the room, you are, say, six teams, and so you're all working on the same product. A little bit of movement between those teams means that, as a whole, you're still kind of like a super team, right? You, 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 you're, you're getting to know each other as a group. So it's not like a total stranger is coming into your group, right? I know Bob. Bob usually sits there and I'm always sitting here. So um, then it can work really nicely, especially also if it's kind of bottom up. So a team member decides for themselves, like, you know, uh, I think I'm going to join that team for a while because I think I'm really needed there right now. Or I think uh, it seems like, listen, you guys are really good at continuous delivery. Can I join you for three sprints, for th or a couple of sprints? And just kind of um, absorb that knowledge and then maybe go back to my own team. Right? So that's mostly stable teams. You need to find, find, find a balance. So, those are five ingredients. And um, there's more, of course. What other ingredients would you add? Shout out. Huh? Come on. Coffee. Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> ingredients that increase the odds of alignment. What would you add to this? Diversity, definitely. Interest. What? <laughs> Communication? Certification? <laughs> I just heard, I heard some white noise over here. I, I just <laughs> Anything else? What about here? You guys are so quiet. Speak up. Servant leadership. Servant leadership. Yeah, that helps a lot, right? I mean, so this is not a complete list. This is just as things that popped into my head. Um, but, <laughs> but wait. Something really important has not been said about this. And if I were to end the talk now, you'd be really upset about it, but you wouldn't really realize it until like, tomorrow. Right? And uh, any guess? What have we not talked about? Talked about ingredients. Buy and method. Yeah. So, so who the heck puts in the ingredients? Right? Does it just happen? Does this just kind of happen? Right? You got eight teams, and then. And then, you know, someone watches this presentation and the ingredients just show up on, on, on magically, right? Um, no. So who puts the ingredients in? Where, where, where do they come from? Yeah. You guessed it. It's you, the Hutsi Tutsi. It's This is the paper sauce. This is leadership happening. This is you, this you, this you, this you. The feedback loop. You've got to find out if it's working, right? <laughs> so who the heck is this chef, right? We need this chef. I find it very funny that in the Agile community we like to sometimes pretend there's no leaders. <laughs> because I've noticed it's been extra clear at Spotify because Spotify has been kind of proud of the, you know, uh, we're so decentralized, so autonomous. So when new managers join Spotify tribe leads, they're almost a little bit scared. Like, how do I... How do, I, how do I interact? Because I don't want to be that leader that just pushes stuff down. So there's a kind of an anarchy-based culture. And, um, but then I notice we're, 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 we're really bad at big projects, and now we're better at it. And guess what the difference is? Leaders. <laughs> um, but often it's like, oh, no, no, we don't have a leader. We just have uh, Lisa here. She's just the coach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but what does she do? Oh, she's just you know, making sure everyone understands where we're going and what the status is, and she's like, Okay, yeah, coach, sure. <laughs> um, so often they're, they're in there somewhere hiding, right? Um, and uh, if you look at some, like there's this tendency of, uh, in the Agile community to believe that, that leadership is just something uh, like, a, like, a, like a dirty word. So I'm going to coin a term leader phobia. Uh, irrational fear of leaders and leadership. <laughs> yeah. Any leaders in here right now? Hand up. Oh, shit, there's one. <laughs> right. Uh, and the mistaken belief that all leaders are evil and all leadership is bad, right? There is bad, there is bad leadership out there, 
in many cases, it's not because the person is a bad leader. It's because they're in a system that kind of drives this behavior. But leaders are, on the other hand, often in the position to change the system. Right? Anybody know about this company? Hand up if you've heard about that company. Some have heard about it. What about this company? Anybody heard of that one? Hand up, yeah. What about that one? Yeah. So what do they have in common, these three? What? Good leaders? Good, good companies. Well, yeah, I guess. I guess they're doing good. Yeah, they are, as far as I know. But um, what else? People talk a lot about these companies. And, and what's all the buzz about? Managing without managers. Valve, how going boss free empowered the games maker. Because that was a workplace where no one and everyone is the boss. Right? These are known for being flat. Right? These, are, these are companies that pride themselves with saying that there is nobody in charge here. Everybody kind of decides what, what to do. Um, of course, they're not really saying there's no leadership, but they're being very clear about that there's that, the, the kind of the vibe is that there's no leaders, no appointed leaders. Right? And what's really interesting about this is if you start looking kind of closer, you notice that, well, you start thinking about who enabled this, who, who, who created this culture where at Valve anybody can choose to work on whatever they want. Who kind of made that possible? Turns out that hiding behind the bushes, <laughs> we have someone named Ricardo, who is the guy who's been writing the books and doing the talks about this. He's created this system. We have someone named Gabe at Valve. If you look at their organizational structure, they draw it like this. Gabe, everyone else. <laughs> it's a flat structure. It is flat. Everyone. And then at Zappos, who is the one who's made Holacracy a thing at Zappos? This guy, right? He's the one who, who, who kind of made this possible, who protects this, nurtures this, and actually even forces people to do it because you get fired if you don't want to. Right? <laughs> so the leaders are there, but they're just doing something different. They are creating an environment where they don't need to lead on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a very different type of leader, but the leader is still there. They're putting in the ingredients. Right? So I think that's important, to not discount the importance of, of leaders in enabling aligned autonomy. Um, the leader doesn't have to be formally appointed, right? You can call it whatever you want. You can call it the chief product owner. Some might call it that. Some might even call it, you know, the project leader, right? Uh, road manager, lead coach, Uber scrum master, head honcho, or just Bob or Lisa. I, it, it doesn't matter what you call the person, but kind of acknowledge that this person is needed, right? And what is this person's job? kind of to paint this picture, right? This is why we're here, right? We're here to, to achieve this. And by making that really clear, it's easier for teams to decide for themselves, well, what does that mean for me? What should I be working on, right? They're the ones who are looking, their day-to-day -day work is thinking about the ingredients, like, hmm, what can I do to improve the feedback loops here? People keep running to me to get information. That's a dysfunction. How can I make sure there's better feedback so people can talk to each other, right? Et cetera. They're working very hard to make themselves redundant, and they usually fail. Um, so what does this leader not do? Well, they're not the single ringable neck. It's not like, well, Lisa is a single accountable person. If the project fails, we know that Lisa is the person to fire, and then everything is fine after that, right? <laughs> uh, no, that, 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 that's not the idea. Um, the idea is to create a shared sense of accountability. And that's kind of hard. That's why we need a person focusing on it, right? But all these ingredients that I mentioned in the soup helps. All those things help. Transparency, purpose, feedback loop organizational learning, all these things help. Um, their job is not to align the teams, right? We don't want, like, at Lego, all these people running around trying to synchronize, running meetings and doing spreadsheets, trying to keep everybody synchronized. No, their job is to create conditions that enable teams to self-align, right? The dependency board is a very concrete example of that. There's the big picture. Go align with each other. You don't need to talk to me, right? Talk to each other. Um, the, the leader's job is not to be the one making the decisions. Instead, the leader's job in this way of looking at the world, the leader's job is to ensure that decisions can be made. When I interview people who have been leading these more successful projects, they emphasize this, that we create an environment where people feel empowered to make decisions and where they also have the information they need to make decisions. And when decisions get stuck, that comes to me. But my job is not to make the decision. My job is to figure out why is it stuck? Why can't this decision be made right now? Right? It's an important distinction. And the job is definitely not to keep people busy. <laughs> filled in your timesheet this week. You know, obviously you have some space here, right? 
you need to work harder, right? <laughs> no, uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Make sure people are not busy. You don't want people 100% allocated. Just like you don't want a traffic system where every piece of the road is full of cars, right? That means everything just grinds to a halt. You want slack in the system. Like in any kind of queuing system, you need slack or things stop. So the leader's job is to create slack in the system. Make sure there is space where there's nothing allocated. At Lego, um, we have this notion of, of, of an innovation and planning sprint. This is, by the way, from the SAFE framework, Scaled Agile framework, although we've taken it and morphed it into kind of our, our needs. But one good thing in that framework is the notion of an innovation and planning sprint, which means that every, um, like every few or so sprints, in our case, every fourth sprint, is a sprint that you don't put anything into at all, zero. You don't plan anything in that sprint. Um, so what happens during that sprint? Well, that's going to catch overflow from the first three sprints. So if you didn't get done, that's really important. But it's also going to provide some space for things like hackathons um, and kind of catching opportunities, low-hanging fruits, stuff that wasn't in the plan. That's an example of putting slack in the system. Every fourth sprint is empty, right? That's like a, a, a leadership action if you put that in place. Um, and it doesn't have to be a single person either. It doesn't have to be one person. In fact, I find it works best when it's two or three people who fill this role. Why? Well, because if this person is sick one day, that's kind of a bummer if it's just one person. Plus, if it's two, they, they can bounce with each other and provide different perspectives. You get more diversity, et cetera. At Spotify, we have kind of standardized on this notion of a trio. So anything important that's going to happen, you'll find a trio somewhere. And the trio is somebody with a tech perspective, someone with a product perspective, someone with a design perspective. They work as a tight-knit kind of team within the team. And they just um, provide the, the, the ingredients that I, that I was talking about. Another pattern, which I see a lot at both Spotify and Lego and lots of other companies, it's, it's an old established pattern, but it also works kind of well, is the notion of a core team. So we have all these teams here. we got 18 teams working on this big thing. But here we have a core team. And it's a few representatives from each of these teams, or it could be full-time people, and they provide this kind of leadership. So again, it doesn't matter what you call it and how you package it. It's just that somewhere there needs to be someone or some people that have as their focus being the master chef, putting in the ingredients, right? Okay, so uh, that's about all I got, and now it's time for the test. So, what's ingredient number one? Yeah, shared purpose. Ingredient number two. Yay, amazing. What about ingredient over there? Ingredient number three. Right, and a cameraman back there. What's ingredient number four? <laughs> what about there? Do you remember ingredient number four? Okay, help out. Yeah. Uh, and what about sitting on the stairs trying to hide? What's number five? What? Yeah, organizational learning. Great, cool. All right. So uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be around for questions. Right? And we're a bit early, so maybe we can do questions. I don't know. Do we do questions? Yes? You want, are you going to be throwing the mic at people, or are they going to shout? Or what's this? Question over here. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. The question is, do you need a strong personality cult to achieve alignment at scale? That's a really good question. Uh, I'll bounce that right back. How many of you think you need a strong personality cult to achieve alignment at scale? Hand up. Look around. Uh, that's not a whole lot. How many think that's not a critical component? It's a pretty mixed bag here. Add something. Yeah, go ahead. So you need more than one. Yeah, my experience, I would say just judging from what I've seen so far, you do need some strong individuals, but they don't need to be like, like um, kind of the guru type people that everyone is talking about. Sometimes they're kind of standing in the background. At Lego, the person who's driving the change there is someone most people don't know he's doing it, right? At Spotify, we have a very charismatic leader, and he's always emphasizing these things about, so I would say there it's helped us a lot that the top leadership is emphasizing learning and autonomy. So it, it certainly helps.
But I wouldn't say it's, 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 it's like, if you can, I wouldn't say that if you don't have that, you can't do it. Good question. What about over here? Any questions? Quiet group. What about over here? No questions. Hi, Henry. All, the questions, all the questions are in the middle. Okay. Back there. I've got a question. Oh, Mike. Yeah. Mike is power. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the management or problem solving uh, meetings that happen at Lego. Yeah. Are they scheduled or um, how often do, do they occur? So at Lego, in that example, um, that alignment session happens every second month on a cadence. So we know in advance, like a year in advance, we know exactly which date, which location this is happening. And at, during that day, we have all the teams and all the managers and all the stakeholders in the same room. Um, so that meeting happens on that day right after lunch. There are, of course, other meetings happening other periods also. It's not like the only time they meet. But, but that particular meeting I talked about happens every second month in that location. All right. I was talking about the smaller problem-solving meetings. You, you had a uh, slide with a few people on there. Okay, we'll take it offline. Uh, help me. Which, which example was it? Where we... Uh, Oh, 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 the demo when we're all like, shit, this product is not cool. It's not good. We need to fix it. Or, no? Uh, I don't remember. There's like 60 slides in here. I was like, <laughs> what? Yeah, okay. The lunch thing was the Lego two, every two month thing. So, uh, so the, the picture I showed you with all the managers standing in a ring and they have to stay while everybody else goes to lunch, that was at the bi monthly uh, alignment event at Lego. Sorry about not knowing exactly what slides I have. Yeah. So how long have we been doing the company bets things? Actually, uh, uh, four years ago we were using something called OKR. How many of you know about OKR, Objectives, Key Results? We used that for several years. It's just a similar kind of model, which we it was okay, but it was OKR. It was okay, but then we figured that we didn't like the batching. It batches work into into, into, into quarters. We didn't like that. We figured a quarter, that's too long for a team. And it's too short for, for a lead team. So, so it's like it doesn't fit any, anyone really. So we ditched that. And then we invented our own model, which we called priorities and achievements, which was great on paper, but it didn't work in practice for some reason. And we ditched that. So about a year ago, we started rolling out. So I would say about two years ago, we started thinking about this model, which we call the Spotify Rhythm. Um, and then about a year ago, we started gradually rolling out. It's too early to say that it's working great but it's clearly better than what we've had in the past. So I think we'll be using that for a while. It's been very iterative though. It hasn't, there's no big bang. We've started small. Okay. So um, when you started at Spotify, what would you have said would have caused you to say it's not gonna work here? And then that's the first part of the question. The second part is did you bring any musical instruments with you? The second question, did I bring an instrument with me? No, but I'm sure that if you have any instruments here, I, I, I love jamming, so yeah. Um, the first question was, uh, what? <laughs> so, uh, when you started as Spotify, what would have been the, the moment where you realized that it's not going to work here? As in, you won't be able to work with the organization to, to maybe implement Okay, ideas. that happened with me actually. The client that was at before Spotify, no names mentioned, <laughs> another pretty well com known company though, and I was with them about a year on and off, and then I left because I noticed that I couldn't make as much of an impact, except very locally. And the reason there was because the company got bought by Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the fact that the teams were in Stockholm and the, and the leaders were in London. And I realized I either have to spend a lot of time going to London all the time, and I didn't want to do that, or continue just fixing symptoms or go somewhere else. So that was an example of, yeah, I, I kind of gave up on that. But also, I also want to emphasize that the stuff I talk about Spotify, I haven't been driving this at Spotify. I've just been supporting. There's a lot of people who have been driving these things. So it's a big company. Yeah? All right. Uh, the next question. Uh, y you've been talking about driving this at Spotify, and... Um, You've been you know, saying it works, but how do you know? In the sense that uh, what metrics do you use to actually evaluate the performance? Yeah, and that's to a say good that question. Actually... So uh, the team I work in at Spotify focuses a lot on evaluating how the stuff we're doing is working or not, because it's anyone's guess, right? 
So we do quite a lot of research, and mostly interviews. So we, we do random sampling. Um, that's a common technique we use. So instead of interviewing all people, we would randomly, literally randomly roll the dice 30 times, find 30 people, sit down one hour with each, each person, and just find out, so, you know, what's happened since we introduced this model? Is it working, is it not working? We, we also use that as basis to decide what models are needed. So for example, before we introduced that model, we, our data showed that a lot of teams were suffering because of lack of alignment. They were saying, like, we are sub-optimizing. We're autonomous, and that's great, but then I noticed after we built something, we noticed that it doesn't fit the big picture, and that kind of sucks. So we, 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 we are clear about where the company wants to go, and we are clear about what we're doing, but there's this twilight zone in the middle, like the one I talked about at Lego. That was really clear in the interviews. So that way, we could see that there is demand for some kind of model to help us get, get, get aligned. In this case, with the Spotify Rhythm, this model, we haven't actually gotten to that point yet. We're actually there right now. We're just about to start a series of kind of follow-up sessions to find out it seems to be working, but let's find out if it really is working. Yeah, the, so, uh, the question was about, was about metrics. Um, the bottom line, it's really valuable to have a bottom line metric. The one at Spotify is monthly active users. That's the main metric. So we try to, to, to connect what we do to measurements of, of, uh, of uh, uh, monthly active users. That's easier to do when you build features. So if I'm a feature team and I'm going to put a feature out, I can release it to 1% of all users, and then I can measure and compare, and I can notice that, well, the A-B tests tell us that these users are more engaged than those users, so we can connect it to the metric. With these kind of models, the connection is so indirect, I can't think of any way to directly say that, well, we have 18% more monthly active users because of Spotify Rhythm. I don't think we'll ever get there. But what we can get to is teams telling us that we are a lot more focused now, and we are wasting a lot less time. So that's just a proxy metric, but it's something. Um, you mentioned um, the programming increment planning at Lego, yeah. 150 people, two days, and so forth. What one kind day of, uh, sorry? One day nowadays. Yeah. Oh, one day, okay. Uh, what kind of uh, prep work is required for that to be successful? What kind of prep work is required? Yeah. Um, I'd say the main one is, is about prioritization, that we need to have the backlogs in order. We can't go there and not have a prioritized list of what needs to get done. So, so there's a lot of prep work for the product owners. But other than that, nowadays it's not a whole lot because you do this every second month. People, people are pretty much used to this. So there's quite little prep work, at least as far as I know. Maybe someone at Lego is going to watch this and hit me on the head because I don't know what all the prep work they're doing. But, but now, the first time there was a lot of prep work because we had to train people, help them understand what, what all this is. But now it's just business as usual for them. So it's not, it's not a big deal. Uh, we have time for one more question. Right. Uh, yeah. Who's facilitating that meeting, that planning meeting? Who's facilitating that yeah. meeting? Um, it's Lars who's doing it. <laughs> oh, that's a good observation. Yeah. So yeah, who, the question, there is actually a role which is also from Safe called the Release Train Engineer. It's kind of like a Scrum Master at a higher level, and and the guy at Lego is doing that. His name is Lars, and yes, we did a talk together at, at another conference a year ago. We 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 we, we do that in pairs though. We, we it's always a pair facilitating, and we rotate the pairs a little bit. You need somebody to do it who's good at facilitating. That's important, yeah. I guess we're done, right? So awesome. I'll be around. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.